Wired.com presents The Geek's Guide to the Galaxy. And here is your host, David Barr Kirtley. Hello, and welcome to episode 186 of Geek's Guide to the Galaxy. Our guest today is Tim Powers, author of such novels as The Nubis Gates, Last Call, and Declare. Along with his friends James Blaylock and K.W. Jeter, he's considered one of the founders of the steampunk genre, and he was also good friends with Philip K. Dick, who included a character based on Tim in his novel Valis. Tim's pirate novel On Stranger Tides inspired one of my all-time favorite video games, The Secret of Monkey Island, and also provided the premise for the fourth Pirates of the Caribbean movie. Tim was also one of my instructors at the Clarion Writers Workshop back in 1999. And now, here's our interview with Tim Powers. All right, so we're here with Tim Powers. Welcome to the show. Well, thank you, David. Happy to be here. Okay, and so your new book is called Medusa's Web. So what's that about? Well, uh, broadly speaking, I guess, it's about um, a brother and sister who return to the decrepit mansion in the Hollywood Hills where they were brought up uh, because their aunt has died and left a will. And when they get there, they discover that they're enmeshed in a bunch of supernatural mysteries that have their origins in Hollywood in the 1920s. Right. And so the book jacket describes this as the House of Usher in the Hollywood Hills. Does it really? Okay. That's not bad. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, in, in what way do you think it's similar to the House of Usher? Well, uh, the House of Usher is, is mentioned in the book. Um, at one point, there's kind of ghostly communication with the dead aunt, and she's uh, in the midst of kind of dementia gibberish, uh, quotes some bits from the House of Usher. And so I sort of, to an extent, kept that story in mind as I was plotting the book. Um, so it's a big, old, uh, the dangerous house uh, occupied by a couple of um, <laughs> insane and evil uh, uh, people. Right. And so you're, you sort of have two pairs of siblings, too, which kind of reminds me of the House of Usher. Yeah. In fact, one of them's named Madeline, as uh, the sister was in the House of Usher. Right. And so then Library Journal says, this novel is as weird as anything Powers has written. Do you agree with that? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah basically, uh, what the two things I started with were... Uh, I idly reading a biography of Rudolph Valentino discovered that it took two priests to give him last rites when he was dying. One priest, you know, came to attend him in his hospital bed and baffled had to leave and come back with another priest in order to do it thoroughly. And I thought that was intriguing. Uh, you know, what would, uh, what would constitute an obstacle in that? And then the other thing was that I've always been struck by um, Cord Wainer Smith's story, The Game of Rat and Dragon, in which the adversaries were two dimensional. And I was thinking, how would how would two dimensional creatures even manifest themselves, much less pose a threat? And so I took those two things and. Um, researched very hard into Valentino, which led me to various other figures in Hollywood in the 20s, and also to Aubrey Beardsley, uh, who inspired Valentino's second wife. She was a costume and set designer. And of course, once Aubrey Beardsley came up, the idea of two-dimensional things looked pursuable, since obviously drawings are two-dimensional. And uh, so it sort of went from there. So it, it did wind up, as Library Journal said, it did wind up, I got to say, very weird. 
Well, so say a bit more about your writing process, because this is how you write novels, right? Is you do a lot of research and you try to draw connections between the odd facts that you discover. Yeah, uh, it usually starts, I'll just be reading some nonfiction for fun and snag on some fact and think that seems irrational. That seems inadequately explained. Um, wait a minute. Why, why would the guy do that? And if I run into two or three such snags in a nonfiction book, I start to think maybe, maybe you could cook up a, a supernatural backstory in which those enigmatic or irrational, apparently irrational actions actually make sense. And as soon as I decide that, it stops being recreational reading. And uh, for example, I almost pursued um, a book on mountain climbing after reading John Krakauer's Into Thin Air. And so I got a whole bunch of books on mountain climbing and it never went anywhere, but uh, it might still one day. Mm -hmm. But I just read anything connected with the initial, you know, uh, in, uh, impetus, and um, and I feel free to follow any sidelines that show up. Like if I discovered that, I don't know, if Valentino had been an ardent beekeeper, or if his father had been, or his family, I would have felt bound to read up on beekeeping, looking for weird clues. And as I read in this very widespread net way, um, I'm always looking for odd facts, persons, uh, habits, uh, traditional rituals, uh, locations that are too cool not to use. And once I've got 20 or 30 things that are too cool not to use, Obviously, I have 20 or 30 pieces of my eventual book. And so the trick then is to connect the dots. So um, I never approach a project with a story in mind and then do research to, you know, shore it up. I always do the research looking for the pieces that will eventually make up the book. I have no story in mind before the research provides it. Right. And then one of your rules for yourself that I think is really interesting is that you say that you can't violate any actual historical fact. Yeah, um, that's kind of for two reasons. Um, one, I really want the story to seem to be taking place in this here actual world that we're in. I don't want any hint that it's an alternate reality. Um, I, I want to emphasize, no, it's here. It's this this here reality. Um, and so uh, sticking very strictly to the facts is sort of a good discipline to, uh, I mean, because you never know. The, the readers are always smarter than you suspect. If I was to deviate from what I know actually happened, I, uh, some readers would say, oh, I guess this must be some kind of imaginary world. Um, and then just sort of superstitiously, if you look at it as kind of an arbitrary rule, I think it's, um, I just sort of feel like it's good luck to stick with the established facts and days of the calendar and uh, who was actually where and what they actually talked about. It seems to me like deviating from that reality just for the convenience of... Uh, an easier assembled plot would be bad luck. Right, right. And now, so when you picked up this biography of Rudolph Valentino, were you a fan of his or a fan of those sorts of films already? Yeah, yeah. Uh, my wife and I are both big fans of silent movies, uh, her more than me, and she's always telling me, oh, you got to read this book. you got to read up on this guy. Um, in fact, Medusa's Web involves uh, peripherally the murder of this 1920s director, William Desmond Taylor. Uh, and to this day, nobody knows who killed him. And uh, my wife said, you got to read this biography of 
William Desmond Taylor. It's fascinating. And so I did, and I thought, yeah, yeah, well, no, what the hell was going on there? And he was involved with, it was a pretty small world, really, small society then in Hollywood. So he was involved with Valentino and Natasha Rambova, who was Valentino's second wife, and Ala Nazimova, who was a sort of glamour queen at the time, though she wound up in penury late in life. Um, all of them turned out to be fascinating characters. And the, the structure of my book is such that my 2015 characters get to um, meet and interact with those historical people. Right. It sounds like it was a little dangerous being a director back then, because you mentioned this guy Thomas Ince died under mysterious circumstances as well. That's right. I also deal with Thomas Ince's death, uh, which, again, was very mysterious. Uh, he died on William Randolph Hearst's yacht during a little cruise, and everybody who had been guests on that cruise later insisted that they had not been. Oh, I was nowhere near there. I, I was in I was in New York. Um, and Ince's body was taken off the boat and immediately cremated. And then Hearst paid a fortune to Ince's widow. And in fact, there's been a lot of speculation about what exactly killed Ince. Uh, there was a movie called, I think, The Cat's Pajamas. Um about that incident and in that movie it was Hearst himself who killed Ince because allegedly Ince had been um, carrying on with Hearst's girlfriend uh, who was that Marion Davies so what is it exactly that you and your wife find so interesting about these silent movies well uh, let's see um, for one thing, it was a whole lot freer. Uh, it was, of course, way before all the codes. And there were a lot of things people worry about now that never occurred to those old movie makers to worry about. Um, sexism, racism. Uh, it was kind of a wild and undisciplined field. Um, and they were actually really good actors um, since they didn't have dialogue to convey things. Um, people always imagine silent movie stars as sort of mugging and using exaggerated expressions. But, um, but actually um, Lillian Gish, Mary Pickford, uh, many of them were really, really great actors. Um, and it's interesting to see what they were able to accomplish without any special effects, hardly at all. I mean, they could do some things in camera, like make someone seem to disappear or, or run things backwards. But um, all the stunts were absolutely real. Somebody had to actually do all those things. Um, and they, it had the virtue of... Um, a silent movie could be shown anywhere in the world. All you had to do is uh, change the language of the dialogue cards. Um, it didn't need dubbing or subtitles. It's it's a, a brief. I mean, how long could it have lasted since in 1927 the talkies came in? So it was a brief period of movie making, but um, a lot deeper and richer, I think, than most people appreciate. Right. And so in particular, this book really focuses on this 1923 silent film, Salome. Why did you decide to kind of focus on that one? Um, mainly because um, Natasha Rabova, who um, designed the costumes and the sets, um, was powerfully influenced by Aubrey Beardsley. In fact, in the credits, it says inspired by Aubrey Beardsley. And, um, and because I posit that Rambova and Ala Nasimova, who made the movie, who was the director and star, were both very involved with Valentino. So it was a, a short step to take a close look at that movie. And then once I watched the movie with the kind of 
paranoid schizophrenic mm-hmm. squint I adopt when I'm doing research. It was very easy to say that the movie, its details um, were in fact closely uh, in, aligned with the concerns uh, of my book, uh, the, the supernatural situation that I say uh, applied at the time to those people. It's a weird movie. It's a, it's a kind of spooky, weird, senseless movie. Hmm. Well, yeah, so, I mean, those supernatural elements are really referenced, I think, in the title, Medusa's Web. Do you want to say a bit about why you decided to title the book that way? Well, the two-dimensional things that provoke these sort of possessions or visions or transtemporal interludes um, are based on some abstract things Beardsley did, and it was easy to say that, well, they, they, they look like spiders. But let's say they are eight-limbed patterns which provoke this effect on anyone who looks at them. And at that point, I, I always start thinking about mythology. I think, well, what do you got for spiders in mythology? And I thought, well, there's the African spiders, but, you know, Anansi, the spider, African spider god, but Neil Gaiman kind of grabbed that. Hmm. Uh, and so I thought, well, what about Medusa? How many snakes were on her head? Let's say it was eight. Um, and looking extensively into the Medusa mythology, I discovered that in the very oldest uh, renderings of her, she really was just a, a head, a bodiless head. And so when Perseus cut her head off, maybe maybe that uh, is the story remembered slightly wrong. Remember she maybe she was always a bodiless head. And if we say she had eight snakes growing out of her head, we you know, you're kind of at the spider at that point. And so I kind of conflated Medusa and spiders and webs and uh I like to think that at least for the duration of somebody reading the book, it will sort of make sense. Right. And the characters in this book suggest that Medusa didn't actually turn people to stone, that that's a bit of a mistranslation. Is that true? Right. I say um, what what the original Greek text was is something more like rigid, um, paralyzed, frozen, um, rather than literal you know, granite or something. And uh, that was a a convenience for my plot and a fairly plausible thing to say. I mean, who's going to say that uh, the old Greek myth wasn't that way? Half the time, if it's very late at night, uh, I, I find sometimes when I open some new research book, it'll appear to confirm my fictional theory and i'll think oh my god powers you're not you're not making this up you you've stumbled on the actual story here except in the morning i'm saying again (laughs) well yeah because you're able to draw connections between this medusa spider thing and all sorts of things i mean you mentioned king david and lamano negra and the tarantella dance um just all these kind of things all that stuff fit in really with no shoehorning at all. Um, The Tarantella dance, for example, really was originally um, supposed to be done in order to cure the effects of a spider bite. And Tarantella is where the word apparently tarantula comes from. And I thought, well, gee, that's handy. And Valentino came from, lived for a while in Toronto, where the Tarantella originated. And I think, jeepers, this is practically writing itself. (laughs) Um, But that's the sort of moment when I think, oh, my God, I bet this is all true. Um, And what were the other things you mentioned? The Tarantella dance? King David and Romano Negra. 
Yeah, well, Simona Negra, of course, you got a black hand. There's five. Put three more on it, and you've got, uh, you know, eight limbs, eight legs, whatever. Um, and there is a story that King David hiding from, I think, King Saul. King David wasn't King David yet. Um, hid in a cave, and a spider obligingly quickly built a web across the mouth of the cave. And so when King Saul's soldiers came by, they said, well, obviously nobody, he ain't hiding in that cave because obviously he had busted the spider web if he ran in there. And so the spider uh, helped David out. And of course, it's very easy to say, well, that's how tradition remembers it. But actually, David hung one of these spider symbols over the mouth of the cave, which disoriented and uh, provoked fits in his pursuers when they saw it. Right. So to come across a fact like that, do you go searching somehow for spider mythology or are you just reading random things all the time and coming across that sort of thing? Both. Uh, once I know the direction, I'll start looking for mentions of spiders, you know, you think, well, uh, or, or, or Medusa or et cetera. Um, and fortunately, for example, for the Bible, there's giant concordances and you can just look up spiders in the Bible and it'll give you every reference. And another handy thing is uh, Bartlett's familiar quotations. You can look up Medusa or spiders or whatever's relevant in the back and it'll say, you know, Sophocles on, Plato on, Shakespeare on, Marlowe on, and you can look up all those quotes and with luck to find one or two that that make you think, oh boy, yes, sir. Hmm. Uh huh, I can use this. How about in the films? Because you also mentioned odd spider references in films like uh Ingmar Bergman and uh Yeah. Yeah, that's weird as hell. Um that Bergman movie, uh, what's it called? In a Glass Darkly? I yeah, through a, through a Glass Darkly. Yeah, a quote from St. Paul. Um, and yeah, there's a weird scene in there where uh, the woman who's going crazy um, says uh, God in the form of a spider materialized out of a wall and tried to rape her. I think, cool. Um, and therefore, I say that, in fact, what I say with all this research is that's no coincidence. Bergman was referring to this phenomenon, which had always been a sort of secret vice in the movie industry. Um, yeah, always uh, with research, my governing principle is none of this is a coincidence. If Einstein did something in Germany in the same on the same day that Charlie Chaplin broke his toe in Hollywood, <laughs> I think, aha, not a coincidence. Of course, I'd be nuts if I took this into everyday life. Right. I was also really curious about the thing about Henrik Ibsen's rough draft of the dollhouse. Is that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, no, there wasn't actually a rough draft that his agent forced him to revise. I made that up. But but in the play, um, which one is it? Hedda Gobbler? The Doll's House. Oh, The Doll House, yeah. Um, yeah, at one point, uh, the woman character does go into a frenzied Tarant, specifically Tarantella dance. And I think, well, okay. Uh, it's not a coincidence. Um, what, how, how did she happen to get exposed to one of these spiders so that she had to do that? Uh, well, I don't know. Let's read the play with a paranoid eye and, and look for, you know, what a suppressed first draft might have consisted of without altering the actual play too much. I want it to be, you know, plausible that a first draft deviated to this little extent. Right. And I remember you telling me that one thing that you do for setting is that you'll drive around and take pictures of all the places that you. Yeah. To write and about. luckily, 
luckily we live just an hour from LA. So my wife and I did drive all over the place. Um, so all, all those places are accurately described and we kind of, um, for the house, the characters are living in, um, caveat, um, we kind of synthesized a couple of actual places for that. And, um, in fact, the way that started, right along with Cordwainer Smith and Valentino's priests, was um, I read about a, a fandom, which is people who collect cheesecake postcards and photos from the 1950s, you know, women in bathing suits. And uh, apparently among this fandom, they noticed that the background of many of their photographs was the same place. And they thought, well, where is this place? And somebody said, well, I recognize that mountain. This is L.A. And evidently they were able to uh, track down the actual site where most of these photographs had been taken in the 50s. And um, there was, in the background of many of the pictures, a big wall with a spider mosaic on it. In fact, that's probably where I got the spider idea. Um, and so I went online, and uh, several people have managed to climb through bracken and hop fences and uh, find the actual ruins of this place where those photos were taken in the 50s. And um, apparently there was once a house there uh, built by a guy who had worked in the movie industry and collected old movie sets. When movies were finished, he would take away the walls and arches and windows and, you know, from Egyptian, uh, medieval French, uh, Russian, any sort, whatever the movie was, he would grab the the settings and incorporate them into this big rambling house he built. And um, I wasn't able to get to that place. I, well, the house is gone now, apparently, but um, I wasn't able to get to the ruins of the spider wall itself because it's on private property and um, the owner said no way. Even after I promised to move it miles away, you know, uh, but just as well since I wanted to alter it for my purposes anyway. Right. Well, how about the detail about all the doors from the different hotels? That I got from a place called the Magic Castle in Hollywood. It's a club uh, of magicians. And it, like caveat, uh, has kind of been assembled from a lot of uh, torn down old hotels and houses and buildings. And in fact, in one room, they do have one wall is just doors that they've collected from, you know, older structures. Um, and when I saw that, I thought, wow, that's kind of neat. A bunch of doors, each one from some different old hotel or what have you. Um, it would be interesting, you know, after the place is closed in the middle of the night to go around and like knock on the doors, <laughs> see if any come in should sound from the other side. So I grabbed that. But yeah, that was from the Magic Castle. Fascinating place uh, altogether. Huh. Well, I mean, one thing that the characters in the book run into a lot is that these places have changed so much since the 20s and often the building isn't there or even the whole hill isn't there. Was that a challenge for you when writing about the 20s? Uh, yeah, although there are still plenty of, um, like, you know, photographs of the missing places. In fact, for Bunker Hill, which was a apparently gorgeous place, uh, in roughly 1900, it was where all the rich people lived and there were just in elaborate mansions. And then by the 1950s, it had, all the rich people had gone elsewhere, Beverly Hills or somewhere. And it had become just kind of rundown apartments and, you know, junkies and pickpockets. 
Raymond Chandler said a lot of stories in Bunker Hill. And, um, and then in about 1965, Los Angeles simply tore all the houses down and scraped the whole hill off, dumped it in the ocean somewhere. And so now the whole hill is gone. Um, as a kid, I did one time in like 1959 ride the Angels Flight diagonal railway up and down with my dad. Um, I wish I remembered it better. But luckily, online, I found that YouTube is a priceless research tool. Somebody in about 1950 hung a camera outside the door of their car and just drove a grid pattern all over Bunker Hill. And God knows why he did it, <laughs> but um, it's a priceless record. And I found that there's a lot of old film noir movies from the 50s that used Bunker Hill uh, very extensively. And so I watched a bunch of old, weird old Burt Lancaster crime movies where the plot wasn't much, but I was real pleased to see the backgrounds, you know. Okay, look, there's that house from the south. Now watch this other movie and you get a view from the north. And and I wound up getting a fairly comprehensive uh, view of those old missing parts of L.A. Yeah, yeah. All right, so I know this book isn't out yet, but have you been getting responses to it from early readers or anything? Uh. Goodreads has some very polite things, um, and there have been a few reviews. Um, but no, really, uh, not not much yet. Because I mean, your wife reads all your books, right? Yes, yes, she she read it, and uh, she always very valuably has things to say, like, "I don't understand what they're talking about," <laughs> or "I thought they were still in the car." but now they're in the kitchen. When did they do that? Or you led up to this scene like it was going to be big news, but then when the scene finally arrived, you simply walked through it. Very perfunctory. And that's valuable because I go fix those things. And then my editor, Jennifer Brell at HarperCollins, also had a lot of questions like, why did this guy do this exactly? And my first thought is, well, it's obvious. And then I think, well, no, if it wasn't obvious to her, it's not obvious. Go go back and make it clearer. Um, so, yeah, readers like my wife and Jennifer Brell are priceless because um, inevitably a book you've written yourself, you, you see all the motivations and uh, developments very clearly because they're in your head. But that doesn't mean they're necessarily clearly in the manuscript. Right. Well, and, and I mean, given that you work so hard to make these conspiracies seem plausible, do you ever hear from people who, who are like, oh, yeah, I know about the spiders, too, or anything like that? <laughs> um, no, I don't think I've ever had anybody say, yes, Powers, I, I you know, I, I see that you're also aware of this secret. Um, I'd mistrust the sanity of anybody who told me anything like that. Um, I know Lovecraft used to get letters from people who'd say, you know, uh, yes, Yog Sothoff is hassling me too. What do I do? Where do I get a Necronomicon? Um, but no, I don't think I've run into anybody who um, actually thought my conspiracy theories were real. Because, I mean, one thing that you, you told me that stuck out in my mind is you said that uh, you were always afraid to handle tarot cards because you were afraid of oh, what yeah. might happen. Yes, yes. Yeah. Um, yeah, I uh, Ouija boards, tarot cards, the I Ching, any of those things where you are supposedly getting information, what, that is to say, if it's not just kids' games, if it's actually accomplishing something, I think, what are you paying for it? What's, in fact, what's the currency? Uh, and the answer is, well, I don't know. And I think, yeah, I'm not playing with that. No, thanks. Um, hmm. 
I'm both entirely skeptical and scared of them. Um, it may be relevant that I'm Catholic, and so supernatural events are not entirely ruled out. Uh, one time I was going to write a book about a sort of the exorcist in San Bernardino. And all my research would have been covered pretty easily because my wife was at the time working at the parish office and uh, knew how, you know, the day-to-day stuff worked. And then I got a book by Malachi Martin, which was actual transcripts of exorcisms, dialogue between priests and devils. And I thought, cool, wow, boy, I've got all my research right here. This is great. And I opened the book, and on the first page it says, the author and publisher advise that anyone reading this book say the following prayer before and after each <laughs> chapter. And I thought, well, I slammed it shut. I don't need that. Uh-uh, I ain't doing that. <laughs> um, so it probably helps in writing the sort of things I write that I'm a little bit antsy about supernatural stuff. Very skeptical, but I don't entirely rule out the whole category. Well, what you were what you were just saying about the warning on the book was reminding me of the story you told about Philip K. Dick, where he would say, I've discovered this secret. And oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, he was very good at that sort of thing. Yeah, he uh, he was always after his weird mystical experience in 1974 researching the pre-Socratics and Talmud and uh, all kind of obscure uh, mystical type stuff. And yeah, he would say late at night over a bottle of wine, looking first nervously into the corners of the room. (laughs) I've, my researches have led me to a discovery. I've, I've found out something that only 12 people in history have known, and each of them died within 24 hours of learning it. I want to tell it to you. And we say, oh, no, no, good God, no. I look, I'm, I can't hear you, I can't hear you. And, of course, then the next day you'd say, geez, Phil, you're still alive? I thought, I thought knowing that day, you know, that you die. He said, Phil, how are you were taking me seriously? That was a bunch of crap. What do you, honestly, you believe anything. <laughs> Um, he was always very mercurial in his, uh, convictions, uh, which leads to a lot of inaccuracies about him. People will say, oh, he was, uh, Episcopalian. He was, uh, Orthodox Jew. He was, uh, you know, um, uh, Gnostic. And I said, yeah, for a day, I'd check with him the next day and he'd be something else. Uh-huh. I mean, it must be kind of strange for you to that that's someone you know, and he's turned into this legendary cult figure. Yeah, it is, uh, and it, it's it's weird to see the sort of um, consensus caricature of him that emerges. This kind of crazed, drug-addled hermit, you know, writing these crazy books all alone. Uh, I think that guy wasn't the guy I knew. Uh, The guy I knew was real sociable and funny, um, well-read, skeptical. Um, It it must be the same with people who knew Byron or Hemingway or any other writer who kind of becomes a legend. You kind of start to notice that the legend doesn't really resemble the actual model much. I mean, do you think about that when you're writing Rudolph Valentino or people like that? Yeah, yeah. Um, I obviously I'm having them do and pursue things that in real life they didn't do or pursue, and have concerns that really weren't ever concerns of theirs. And in a way, I suppose that's unfair. But um, I try not to violate what history lets me understand of their actual characters. Um, I, I think I present Valentino and, uh, Nazimova 
accurately as far as, you know, what sort of people they were. Um, But I do take liberties. It's true. And of course I'm working from the written history, which somebody who actually knew those people might say was distorted and uh, inaccurate, but it's fiction. What the hell? (laughs) Um, All right. So I have a couple of stories that you told me years ago that I've been repeating ever since. And I'm not sure I have all the details right. So I thought maybe I would take this opportunity to check. It's a good idea to check. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. So the the first is about Philip K. Dick um, telling you that he had the power to forgive sins. Yeah. He called me up one morning and said, uh, I said, well, how's the research is going? And he said, uh, well, last night I my research has led me to believe that I had the power to forgive sins. And I said, wow, that's cool. Uh, Whose sins did you forgive? He says, well, none. Uh, This morning I decided I was mistaken. And last night I called K.W. Jeter and he got all huffy and didn't want his sins forgiven. And so I just had to forgive the cat's sins. Hmm. Okay. So, so that's one. And then there's also this story I have in my head about how you guys created the um, Ash Bless character. Oh yeah, Jim Blaylock and I in college, um, in '72, I think. Um, the college paper printed poetry, and it was close enough to the '60s that the poetry was all just horrible free verse about children and flowers and rainbows, and uh, so we figured we could write poetry that would sound very portentous, but be in fact, meaningless. And so we decided to start and I would write a line on a piece of paper and pass it to him and he'd write the next line and pass it back and alternating, we'd write out this poem and when we got to the end of the page, we would bring it to a conclusion and we decided we were going to send this to the school paper and we needed a name for our poet. And William was a friend of ours sitting there, and I said the last name should be one of those two-word names like Longfellow, uh, Wordsworth. So each of us came up with a syllable, and the result was Ash Bless, and the paper published them. And so we wrote another lot that was dumber, and they published that. (laughs) And so we wrote a third lot that was dumber still, and they did not publish that. But ever after that, whenever Blaylock or I have needed to have some kind of crazy poet in a story, we've used the name William Ashblass. It puzzled Beth Meacham, the then editor at Ace, when she got a manuscript from me involving somebody named William Ashblass and then got one from Blaylock involving somebody with the same name. And she wrote to Blaylock and said, do you guys know each other? What's this William Ashblass? And Blaylock said, I'm sorry, did Powers use Ashblass? I'll change my name. And she said, no, no, keep it Ash Bless. Uh, think up some way it could be the same character. Okay, he's going to have to be about 200 years old in Blaylock's book, but okay. And so Ash Bless has been with us ever since. In fact, I've mentioned him in every book just as a good luck piece. I don't want readers to keep saying, no, oh, look, Powers, you know, got to mention Ash Bless. Here's Ash Bless again. So I've done it in different languages. Um, Ceniza Bendiga, I think, is Ash Bless in Spanish, and I think Asche Segnen is Ash Bless in German. But one way or another, I always sneak it in. Right, but there was this thing where people at college wanted to meet him, and so you said that he was like this deformed recluse or something like that? Yeah, we said he was hideously deformed and couldn't uh, physically attend any, you know, readings or meetings. Uh, but he had given us these poems to read in his stead. And at first hearing, some of the poems sounded pretty good, uh, except that Blaylock and I would often break out laughing in the middle of reading them, which people thought was very insensitive of us to be laughing at the poetical efforts of our deformed friend. Right. Okay, and so then another thing that you said, this is a a clarion that you told us that's always stuck in my mind, is that Every time there's a spree shooter or something, part of you always hopes that they'll be found with a copy of a Tim Powers book so that it would get you so much publicity. I don't recall that. Uh, <laughs> uh, you mean like um, Catcher in the Rye? Yeah, like, yeah, like that sort of thing. Um, 
Was I sober? What year was this? <laughs> uh, I, uh, I, I'm not sure. What year were you, Clarion? 99. 99. Yeah, I was sober then. Um, <laughs> well, I suppose. Um, uh, <laughs> I mean, it it would be publicity. Uh, <laughs> I'd rather, um, you know, the Pope would be seen with a copy of one of my books in his back pocket. Um, but I remember, um, who was, do you remember the young lady that was kidnapped at age 12 and not discovered for 18 years in Northern California? Um, I, mean, I don't know her name. I, I don't remember her name, but when People Magazine took pictures of the place she had been confined in, there were a whole lot of Dean Koontz books. I, I wanted to tell Dean, you know, hey, look, you've got a fan. Uh, but yeah, I think I'd rather have the Pope um, be seen with it or, you know, some, some sort of widely admired figure. Right, right. Okay, and so then another piece of advice you gave us, I'm not sure if I'm remembering this right, but the way I remember it is that you either want, as a writer, that you either want to get a great job or a terrible job. Do you remember this? Um, I probably said you should have a terrible job. Um, that if you if you want to really pursue writing as a career, it's a handicap to have a good job with benefits and stuff, uh, and you know high pay because no matter what kind of advance you got from a publisher, it would never be enough to justify quitting that you know solid gold job that it's much better to have crappy part-time jobs like at pizza parlors and be a janitor and things like that, because then if you sell a book and get an advance, it's a cinch to quit. Um, and in fact, I've never actually had a full-time job in my life. Okay, and so then when I met you at Clarion, too, I didn't realize that your novel On Stranger Tides had inspired one of my all-time favorite video games, The Secret of Monkey Island. I was just curious if you'd ever played that game. No, I never have. I've, of course, heard of it um, because everybody does say, you know, oh, yeah, it was the inspiration for Monkey Island. Uh, and there's, what, some character named Threepwood, I think. <laughs> yeah. um, but uh, it was nice of the guy who wrote Monkey Island to acknowledge that. Um, and then, of course, Disney bought my book for the basis of the fourth Pirates of the Caribbean movie which was fun, which in fact was very nice. Especially since they they could have said, Powers, you didn't make up Blackbeard the Pirate. You didn't make up the Fountain of Youth. Why should we give you any money? It was nice that they didn't say that. Right, I haven't seen the movie, but I gather that it's not, they didn't take much from from your novel for it. No, just Blackbeard and the Fountain of Youth. And, you know, ships ocean and the, uh, the title right and the title yeah um and and it was you know it got the book back into print and selling well and uh and we got to go watch filming one evening uh briefly talked with johnny depp and penelope cruz talked about hunter thompson with johnny depp and then we everybody was very busy so we ran away and had dinner somewhere uh my attitude toward books into movies is always you guys do what you want. I'm not going to hang on your elbow. I'll go see the movie when you're, when you, when you're finished with it, but I don't, I don't insist that the movie have actually anything much to do with my book. Though I'm always in favor of it if, if they want to do that. <laughs> Um, okay, and so then another thing that we talked about a lot at Clarion, because we are you and I argued about this a lot, but you were saying that you didn't like fantasy that was uh, kind of winking at the reader and too oh, yeah. sort of self-aware and things like that. Yes, yes. I think that's part of what postmodernism is. Um, yeah, I hate tongue-in-cheek uh, irony, um, self-referential uh anything where the writer in effect says to the reader, well, we both know this is just made up stuff, huh? 
I mean, we're both too sophisticated and hip to, like, read for escapism and, and, and actually worry about the characters and, and actually imagine that the story is really happening to real real people in real places, right? Uh, because that's exactly what I do want. I do want to uh, vicariously participate and imagine that it's all actually occurring. And so anytime a writer is flippant, uh, tongue in cheek, uh, you know, breaking the fourth wall, I, I get really annoyed. I think, God damn it. I paid, how much did I pay for this book? I, I, I paid for a performance. I didn't pay for you to be winking at me over the top of the page. That's a big cause of me stopping reading books on page two. Uh, sometimes, you know, I'll get advanced reading copies, you know, where they say, would you like to write a blurb for this book? And I think, I don't know, let me start it. And bang, as soon as there's uh, that sort of in-joke winking uh, tone, I stop. I remember a George MacDonald Fraser book, which I read because I love his Flashman books, but it was called Pirates. And they're reading a magazine called like Play Rogue or Play Knave or something, which was a parallel for Playboy. And in a sword fight, one of them says, you can't kill me on page four. And I thought, that does it. Thank you. In fact, no thank you. Yeah, I don't like that sort of tone in fiction. I feel very cheated. Right, because, yeah, because I used to argue about this with you a lot, because back in 99, I was in college. I remember, I, was, I remember we argued about this. <laughs> yeah, I was really into that stuff, but I, I, I've more and more come around to your way of thinking, and I don't know if you saw the new Star Wars movie, but I totally panned it on this show for exactly that reason. I felt like every scene there was some, like, hey, remember this scene from Star Wars? Remember this scene from Star Wars? That... Yeah, I haven't seen it, but I gather there's a lot of that... Uh not in joke exactly, but in reference to people who have followed the whole series. Um, and I don't like it in Terminator movies. If Schwarzenegger says, I'll be back for the second time, I think, no, that's just winking at us. The first time it was great, but, but now you're just nudging us in the ribs and saying, <laughs> remember, remember, uh, which is taking me out of this immediate story at hand. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, well, actually, speaking of Clarion memories, I was just curious if you remembered anything from my year that stuck out or just from, from other years. Do you have... Oh, I miss that place. I miss um, Michigan State University there with that river and the woods. Um, I know Clarion East now is in San Diego, which hardly makes sense. They should call it Clarion South. Um. I don't know. It all, it all kind of blurs into one. Who was the all, uh, other people in your year? Uh, well, Tobias Bakel and Tim. Pratt. Oh yeah, yeah. And I think uh, Karen Meissner. Yeah, yeah. And John Sullivan. Yep. Yes, yes, I remember. Um, yeah, I remember uh, Toby Bakel uh, getting criticized in the workshop sessions for being too. In a way, the, the the sort of thing I prefer to plain storytelling uh, with uh, no concerns besides, you know, action and intriguing ideas and stuff. Um, and I, I remember thinking, well, no, that's that's what I want. That's that's what I like is, uh, is almost Larry Nivenish invention. Uh, it's a slightly separate thing from that irony and tongue in cheek, but I'm always also uh, rubbed the wrong way when I see evident themes, when I see that the author is not simply telling me about these characters with these problems, but has a bigger purpose, is trying to make some comment about social or political issues of the day. I think, no, don't do that. Don't do that. Uh, I can read the newspaper for that. Um, you're taking me out of the story. You're making the characters only representative types. 
Um, I always think of Galaxy Magazine in about 1969 when all the stories about alien empires 5,000 years in the future, but the big concerns are student unrest and legalizing marijuana and the Vietnam War. And it, no, don't do this. Don't do this. You want to write about those things? Write me some nonfiction. But but don't don't tell me about these science fictional characters, and then make it clear that what they really represent is you know Joe McCarthy or something. Right. Well, that's what's nice about having a podcast is I can just give people my un undiluted opinions about things. And well, good point. Good point. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know if people like it anymore on the podcast than they would in a story, but. I like it. It's more natural on the podcast. It's it's you. It's it's not you pretending to tell us about uh, imaginary characters. I mean, I could go on about politics and stuff here myself, though I won't. <laughs> um, but yeah, the place for that is not, I think, in fiction. I was actually curious. Uh, I, I heard you say that you know uh, Philip K. Dick included you as a character in Valis. The character is David. Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah, Vallis was largely autobiographical. Um, the character David is based on me. The character Kevin is based on K.W. Jeter. Um, what was her name? Um, it's terrible that I don't remember her name, but one character was a girlfriend of a horse lover fat Philip K. Dick, um, who in the book died of cancer. In real life, she survived uh, and only, in fact, died last year. Um, and everything the characters argue about and do in the book, uh, me and Jeter and Phil Dick, and she actually did do until the point in the book where the Savior is reincarnated and they all go up to Northern California. At that point, the book deviates from autobiography but uh yeah un until it deviates that way it uh it's very very uh closely autobiographical and uh i remember reading it and at one point he says uh david that is powers um had withdrawn into himself uh in some sort of catatonic way when confronted with the Savior reincarnated. Um, the Catholic Church had taught him how to do this, how to uh, shut down his senses when confronted with something that violated Catholic orthodoxy. And I remember telling Phil, what the hell is that? What, 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 what are you talking about here, man? And he just sort of went, hee, 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 hee. <laughs> um, and at one point in the book, uh, the Phil Dick character says to the Powers character, would you please not tell us what C.S. Lewis would say about this? Could you do us that one favor? And I said, I don't quote C.S. Lewis all the time. And again, he sort of went, hee, hee, hee. Well, that's actually, that was the thing I wanted to ask you about. I mean, uh, yeah, I mean, were you that big of a, a devotee of C.S. Lewis and are you still? Oh, yeah, I love Lewis. I reread him all the time, uh, largely his nonfiction, though his fiction's lots of fun too. Um, and GK Chesterton, uh, and I'm still practicing Catholic, not lapsed or recovering. Uh, right. Because I mean, that's fairly unusual in my experience among fantasy and science fiction writers. Like I can think of Gene Wolfe obviously would be a big example of a Catholic writer, but most authors that I've uh, met fantasy and science fiction authors are, are not religious particularly. I was just wondering yeah, how, you, how you felt about that. Well, I think it's an advantage. It gives me a different perspective, and uh, a different perspective is a good thing to have. Um, I'm sure there's lots of other ways to have different perspectives too, but um, and as I said earlier, it, uh, Catholicism at least allows for supernatural stuff. I mean, you hope you never run into any, but, but it doesn't rule it out. And so, I don't know, maybe that gives a bit more conviction uh, 
to my stories. Um, but yeah, it uh, also just, I always have a, a streak of contrarianism. If everybody's one thing, I'm always tempted to be the other thing. And so it's sort of fun to um, not be agnostic or atheist if most everybody else is. Okay, so we're pretty much out of time. So just to wrap things up, do you want to tell us about any other projects you want to mention or anything else you have going on? Oh, I don't know. Let's see. Uh, I've got a novella coming out from uh, Subterranean Press sometime this year called Down and Out in Purgatory. Uh, though it's not the orthodox purgatory. Um, and I don't know, I'll be curious to see how it's received. I'm fond of it myself. Um, aside from that, uh, I don't know, it's just sort of business as usual here, I guess. And now you're going to start reading randomly to try to come up with your next Yeah, I've, I've already, I've, I'm already neck deep in it, um, pursuing you weird anomalies that appear to call for a supernatural explanation. Um, it's going to be set in L.A. now again, though not connected with Medusa's Web at all. Um, and really, I, I keep on finding that Los Angeles and Hollywood just are inexhaustible wells of weird enigmatic mysteries that fit my purposes real smoothly i thought it was funny i heard you say that uh that la is your favorite city and you said anyone can love san francisco but it takes a special kind of person to love la well yeah I, san francisco and new orleans you spend a day there you fall in love with the place they're easy uh but you have to kind of get acquainted for a while with la to see its charms um you know people arrive at the airport stay at a hotel, drive around for a couple of days, and they say, I hate Los Angeles. What a horrible place. Like, well, yeah, you, you, two, three days. Of course you don't like it. Uh, go to New Orleans if you want to fall in love <laughs> with a city right away. Go to Paris. Go to San Francisco. But, yeah, L.A., you got to know it a little better to appreciate it. Hmm. All right. Well, look, really looking forward to the next book you write about L.A., and I think we're going to wrap things up there. So we've been speaking with Tim Powers, and his new book, again, is called Medusa's Web. So, Tim, thank you so much for joining us. Well, thank you, David. It's been fun. And that was our interview. So, a big thanks again to Tim Powers for joining us on the show. Big thanks as well to everyone who's given us five stars on iTunes, including Megzi in Australia, who writes, My favorite podcast. I have two to three hours of commuting most days in which I listen to podcasts. That's a lot of podcasts in a week, but this is far and away my favorite. The host, David Barr Kirtley, is an excellent interviewer and always asks the questions I want the answers to. He gives the interviewee plenty of time and scope to talk, and it is surprising how often I think it sounds more like a conversation between like-minded people rather than an interview. He also moderates the most interesting panel discussions of genres, TV shows, movies, and other geek culture topics. I would urge anyone with an interest in speculative fiction, writing in general, sci-fi, TV, and movies, and geeky stuff of all kinds to put this podcast on their list. So big thanks again to Megzi for that great review. Special thanks as well to George Green, Matthew Meyer, and Kay, who all just signed up this week to support us on Patreon. Geek's Guide to the Galaxy is made possible thanks to support from listeners like you. So if you enjoy the show and want it to continue, please sign up to give us a dollar or two per episode over at patreon.com geeks. And if you'd rather make a one-time or fixed monthly contribution, you can do that via PayPal over at geeksguideshow.com slash crowdfunding. And I'd like to give a special thank you to Cyril Simza, PayPal patron number 13, who just became the latest listener to be making monthly contributions to the show. So big thanks again to everyone who's contributed. We really appreciate it. All right, so that was our show. So thanks everyone for listening, and we'll see you next time. The Geek's Guide to the Galaxy is a production of Wired.com. For more information about the show, visit geeksguideshow.com. To learn more about your host, visit davidbarrkirtley.com. Music and voiceover produced by yours truly, Jack Kincaid. If you enjoyed this program, tell your friends. 
If you didn't enjoy it, tell no one. Thank you for listening.